done to the documentary it doesn't really interest me. What interests me is what he did for that form, getting it to the people, the masses, into the mainstream, and getting um, it taken seriously by the distributors. Leave the real world behind and step into the largest indoor family entertainment center in the world. To encourage tourism during its economic decline, the city of Flint builds an auto theme park, a hotel, and a new shopping mall. But Michael makes it seem like this all occurred after GM laid off 30,000 workers. Anyone watching Roger and me would come away from that film thinking that one night Dan Rather gets on the news and says the entire town of Flint has been fired, and subsequent to this economic catastrophe that happened, Flint set into motion three public projects to cauterize what had been an economic hole that had been blown through the community. That's not the way any of it happens, as it turns out. They had been developed, built, and failed of their own accord before there had been any kind of firing. Chronology issues aside, which I just can't really take seriously. I think, it's a, I think it's an enormously honest film because if you just spent half an hour in Flint, Michigan, you just really wouldn't debate whether there was a direct correlation between plants closing and 30,000 jobs going away and the complete decrepitude, if that's a word, of the town. In an interview for his magazine, Harlan Jacobson confronts Michael about the manipulation of time in Roger and Me. Did he answer the questions when he asked about the chronicity? I mean, did he say, well, this is why I did this, or quite frankly, you're right, but it makes for better movie making or to... Never, it just simply veered off into some strange, eerie twilight zone form of paranoia. The conversation took a completely different, crazy train of thought. He accused me of working for Roger Smith, uh, the then chairman of General Motors, that I worked for Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center was in bed with GM. It became a highly paranoid display rather than a conversation of documentarian and a journalist critic. Shortly after the article appears in film comment, Harlan Jacobson is fired. In the years before Michael finished Roger and Me, Flint, Michigan had been held hostage by General Motors. The company threatened to pack up and leave if their property taxes weren't slashed. Jim Musselman and his boss, Ralph Nader, were big critics of GM's demands. Nader had already fought the big three car companies on many issues, particularly auto safety. We had started this whole campaign of bringing Roger Smith to the communities where they were asking for these huge tax abatements. What was amazing to me, the most incredible thing, was it was a coalition of working class people trying to get Roger Smith to address what was going on in their communities. Uh, we're dealing with all kinds of issues that were related to job loss, and we were sounding an alarm for that. At this grassroots meeting, Mike Westfall and Jim Musselman invite Michael Moore to speak. This is very, very significant that all of these people, Teamsters, UAW members, teachers, Black groups, women's groups, peace groups have all come together for the first time. This is a very significant event. We had a public meeting in Flint, Michigan, where 500 people showed up and wanted to fight against General Motors and did organizing, did petitions, did everything. We had people with bullhorns for Roger Smith protesting outside the GM building. And Michael had all this filmed, and I was like, this is great, you know, this is, this is incredible. But at that time, the movie was called Dance Band on the Titanic. While editing the film, Michael shows his friend Jim Musselman a rough cut. He's surprised to learn the focus of the movie is Michael's quest to talk to GM Chairman Roger Smith. He sat there and told me that everything dealing with the citizens' movement, everything dealing with the workers, the union people, that was always on the cutting room floor. I, I sat there and I was like, what happened? All of a sudden, the whole movement changed into Michael. Months later, while promoting his film, Michael forgets about his allies and his struggle against GM. You got a lot of help from, among others, Mike Westfall, a proud UAW uh, member, Jim Musselman, an attorney. He made it look like he came out of nowhere, and, and, and this was his vision, and it wasn't. Well, that's not true. Oh, that's they a lie. Drew, they worked hard oh. on, they fought General Motors' no. back. Please no, no. let me finish, Mike. Yeah. You, you, you do get to speak. I don't know who these other people, these other people you mentioned, uh, the people from, the attorneys from Nader's office, 
uh, hand delivered a statement to you earlier today uh, stating that these people are off on a limb. For the longest time, I struggled with it because it was, it was like I, I felt like Michael was, first of all, somebody I could trust, but somebody who was a friend. At one point, Michael actually was saying that Ralph should retire, that Michael was the new Ralph, and that Ralph can go off to pasture. And that's when I was like, I felt like it was Dr. Frankenstein creating this monster. Ralph trusted him, we all trusted him. And then all of a sudden, it was like, who is this guy? And I'll never forget the phone call after Michael's movie came out. And I said to these people, I said, how about going to the annual meeting next year with Roger Smith and, and bring up this? I said, just let Michael Moore go. He's, he's the great savior. You purport to be a, a supporter of Flint, and yet uh, you made a mockery in the film of a couple of fundraisers that put more than $75,000 back into this community. What are you going to put back into this community? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry I made a movie that millions of Americans want to see. <laughs> Back on tour, Michael is urging the slackers to get off their butts and vote in the 2004 election. Well, here's what we're doing all across the country. If you're a non-voter, tonight I'm going to give you some prizes for committing to vote in front of these people here. And your choices are tonight the sustenance of all slackers, ramen noodles. Ramen noodles. Ramen noodles. Clean underwear. Michael believes if more young people had voted in the 2000 election, there would have been a different result. I have decided to contest this inaccurate and incomplete count in order to ensure the greatest possible credibility for the outcome. Ballots are recounted and both sides challenge the procedures in court while the voters take to the streets. When we read about election fraud in other countries, we accept it unconditionally. Oh, really? In Zimbabwe? Oh, really? In Uzbekistan? Oh, really? In Tajikistan? Really? There was voter fraud? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was some in America, too. That's crazy. You're crazy. I do think that there's been a polarization uh, that's been uh, that's been growing. You have no answer. I don't know that that's totally unhealthy. A passion and a passionate discussion of issues I don't think is bad for democracy. You stole it. We're trying to get it back. More than one time. Uh, I'm really happy that the, the whole thing has uh, sort of blown up in this country's uh, face. Uh, so many things have come up that I think people were never aware of, starting with just the fact that their vote doesn't count. A great deal of Michael Moore's popularity comes from the fact that there simply isn't anyone on the left saying outrageous and unfair things about the right. And because the right so much dominates the media, the Ann Coulters, the Bill O'Reilly's, the Sean Hannity's, who really make very shallow, very aggressive arguments. We expect every American to support our military, and if they can't do that, to shut up. After 35 days of protests and confusion, the Supreme Court rules in a straight party vote not to have further recounts, giving George Bush the presidency. I think we all know that Bush is not legitimate. I think Republicans know it too. And this has been a cancer eating at American politics ever since. There are people who are primed to see this as us against them, and if the religious fundamentalists and the Bush administration are them, then I guess Michael Moore is us. I give you Michael Moore! In the campaign leading up to the 2000 election, Michael Moore backs Ralph Nader, the Green Party candidate. So he throws himself into the 2000 presidential election, he, and he calls Bush and Gore Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Last week, in what they called a debate, I think the moderator summed it all up for me. Welcome, Governor Bush, and welcome, Vice President Bush, uh, I mean, Gore.
no matter how else you feel about the Supreme Court decision or anything else, okay, the Nader vote in Florida lost score the election. Okay, it's really that simple. What's your take on being pegged the spoiler in 2000? That's an arrogant manifestation of the Democrats thinking that they, they own their voters. It's very anti-democratic, of course. Michael abandons his friend Ralph Nader and his hope for a third party in America. Ralph decided to go and campaign in the swing states. And so a lot of us got off his bus at that, at that point because we weren't going to do that. You know, when he said he, he asked Nader to pull out of the race, that was all BS. I was working on the campaign. He was sitting there in the super rallies up until the last week. He finds a hundred different ways to disown it, but that's what he did, and guess what? It was great for him. <laughs> and here's why. If Gore is in the White House, fundamentally, Michael Moore has no career. In 2002, Michael Moore's film Bowling for Columbine catapults him to stardom. His Oscar-winning film takes on America's love affair with guns. It grosses 58 million worldwide, making Michael Moore the cultural icon of the left. On a certain level, Bowling for Columbine is also all about being the opposition to this guy who's in the White House, this right-wing Republican guy who's in the White House who likes guns. I started the film with the attitude that the solution to our problem is that we needed more gun control laws. When we went to Canada, I became very uncomfortable with that position because there's seven million guns that are owned by private citizens in Canada. The guns that Canadians have are long bore single shot hunting rifles. And virtually no one is killed in this country by long bore single shot hunting rifles. You can't take them into the 7-Eleven with you inconspicuously. The guns that kill people are handguns. And handguns are very strictly controlled in Canada. From my cold, dead hands. At one point, Michael blames former National Rifle Association President Charlton Heston for contributing to America's gun violence. 